Um, I'm Nigerian. I also left when I was 11 years old. And um, I fell in love with literature and with poetry. And um, I think Benoki wrote that poets dream the beautiful dreams. And um, we, we, we should never be afraid to do so. We dream for the world and hope they believe. So um, this, is, this is about peace. This is about hoping that someday the reason why we're here is diminished. And um, it's dedicated to the fighters and to the lovers. When dawn breaks like a stretched sonata silence, brown handling the fantastic blue. When dust litters the new quiet like the substance of prophecies before its period of bloom, when life lost the living to its true path, our change will come. It will come after tumultuous multitude of fighters have expired for a reason not worth the breath it is uttered with. It'll come when the subtle structure of global lies fall, sparking that exodus movement of the people with their minds in tow, it will come. Then those born by the river will gather around campfires and finally stop running. The metronomic but melodious hummings of tired mothers will reach a crescendo and pause. Sailors will let, will let up their oars and let the current take them there. The powers of imagination will be fully revealed to men and they will see exactly who they are and who they can be. This will set us free. Free falling towards that second of sensory sovereignty as our senses go insane. That moment will taste like a teaspoonful of forbidden fruit shake mixed with lotus water and lugubriously ladled onto a parched tongue till the whole mouth is rendered rhapsodic, reeling with intent, wonder, and hope. It will smell like fresh sparrows of the new sun, ancient and young, like old wisdom riding a BMX between freight trains in a freezing rain, stained with child's play and laughter, then after it will sound like a cello made of rosewood, exhaling soft poetry over a brown village at night and a quiet after the tempest goes, making the atmosphere finally feel good, and it will feel like a hug from God. Finished with a squeeze, saying, your time has come, and then our time will come. Our suffering will be the greatest stories ever told. Symbols of our heartache will be treasured in sacred places as constant reminders that love never fails, never falls. Our tears will be recognized as rain clouds, and they will be danced beneath. This will be a reflex, uncharted, untold, and our silences will be reincarnated as light after years of just being golden. This is not fantasy, this is reality with a dream complex. I have seen it written in old books. It is the subject of Negro spirituals. It has been spoken of by those who have trespassed in paradise and returned whole. This is our destiny, we are destined to reach that goal. Though weeping may endure for the night, joy comes with the morning. And as we suffer, we gain the passage right. So hold on to your tempests, my friends. Never let go. Hold on. Stay strong. Hold tight. When I was in Kenya, I was working with an organization, an HIV organization, that had a groundbreaking program addressing men who have sex with men. And sure, it was focused on HIV, but it was very bold for the country, given the penalty uh, for same-sex behaviour in Kenya. Um, and, and one of the, the effects of that program was that uh, gay men were rallying around this organisation. Uh, and so it had the effect of sort of building up a community. And I know a lot of people have been to Kenya and they're aware of uh, LGBTI issues. And they remarked that Kenya is really emerging as a, a country that has a, a, a cohesive community. Uh, but then I think a potential problem with that is that it can become exclusionary before it becomes open and participatory. That, and and that there's where the issue of identity comes in, uh, that if it's a Western gay identity that's sort of been imposed or introduced, uh, that can become problematic for the, the man or woman in the village uh, and it starts to exclude. Um, that relates, I think, directly to this issue of human rights. Um, I worked for the UN for the UN agencies for about six and a half years and the agencies have been very good at promoting their awareness of human rights uh, but they've also been very good at ignoring uh, the, right, the right of homosexuals, uh, uh, 
bisexuals, transgender, intersex people, uh, along with many other issues of ignorance, including corruption, whatever, but um, be that as it may. Uh, conveniently, UN agencies seem to forget the indivisibility of these rights. And I know this has been mentioned, uh, but it seems that um, the right to be gay, to be lesbian, to be bisexual, to be transgender, to be intersex, uh, disappears from the discourse when it comes to development organisations. I think that's a key challenge for organisations who claim to be uh, fighting for rights in, in Africa. And not just the UN, there are international NGOs and there are local NGOs uh, who are also to blame. And I think that needs to be a challenge put at the door of these organisations that they can't uh, you know, dis um, ignore that right, ignore that particular challenge just because the culture says it's inappropriate. Uh, in terms of operationalising that, I think the third issue of participation, which was raised, um, is key. That, that emerges from human rights discourse. So to, to participate uh, is a key human right. And organisations, I think, need to take that as a first step in, in, uh, in tackling these issues, particularly at the village level, uh, where village people don't have necessarily access to the, the information they may need, access to the organisations who can provide support. Uh, so I think those three issues are ones that need to be addressed by organisations. Uh, now, the um, human rights, identity and participation. Thanks. Can I just say one thing first? I think we cannot blame religion, but let us blame the people behind religion. Let's blame the old-time interpretation of the Bible and the Quran and many other religious books. And I wanted to lay that out there. Religion is very much part of the African lifestyle. And if we take the gay Africans and black gay people and gay people to take back the theology and claim it. That is what I've been doing for many years. BC is one of the people that inspired me. I was in Nigeria when I saw him on television. It was on the 8th of October 2004. And I was so inspired by his um, boldness to go on the national television in Nigeria. But of course before then, in 2003, the Nigerian president and the Archbishop of Nigeria actually made a statement that you know, there are no gays in Nigeria, and, you know, um, homosexuality is on, biblical is an African, and myself with other activists, you know, went to St. James Piccadilly uh, in 2003 and made a statement, you know, through the media. And from there on, we've been doing a lot more work. Um, religion brings about the well-being and reconciliation, and, you know, I'm a very proud black African gay Christian. And I stand, you know, to interpret the Bible, um, you know, looking at the liberal and inclusive interpretation and theology. Of course, people point to Leviticus and to other passages in the Bible to say it condemns homosexuality. But we know today that the Bible condemns far more than homosexuality. So there is uh, an understanding that it's been taken out of context and it's been actually used as a weapon against us. Unless we stand up and claim it back, we cannot do much. And I'm glad that my friend here just mentioned the UN. Last year, I attended the United Na uh, Nations Assembly twice uh, in 2009, and I'm due back next month. And I think that you know, the Universal Periodic Review is a time where, Africa, where many countries all over the world are called back to the Assembly to actually justify or give reasons for their human rights um, breaches and so on and so forth. So in order to put a face to Africa, I attend these sessions and I have actually done about eight countries so far, I'll be doing another four next month, uh, African countries. So it's always good, you know, um, to sit down in the assembly where you can see a black African gay man speaking on black African gay issues. And you know, it's, it's really something that is not like westernized or just a white person sitting down there speaking on our behalf. Of course, there are many occasions where such things have happened. In 2008, February, um, there was an African Sexuality Conference which took place in Abuja, Nigeria. There were over 33 plenaries around sexuality. Only two were presented concerning gay people in Africa. And I was so upset. I was there, but those papers, the first one was presented by an American and the second one was presented by a Canadian at an African Sexuality Conference. We took the responsibility to change it around. The last African Sexuality Conference took place in Ethiopia um, early this month, and Africans represented Africans on the issue of LGBT, and I'm so proud of that. 